Hi there, just read this disclaimer please. Alright folks, uh, I've got a feeling it might be a bit of a long one this. Um, so it's been a, li a, quite a little while, eight days since the last video. The last video, I hadn't really had any ideas, I hadn't really done anything in the portfolio. Um, but then luckily this morning I found a comment and I thought let's just make a video out of the comment. Uh, I'm not actually sure if the commenter would want their name revealing, so I won't, I won't say the name now. So this was a comment on my Woodford... A comment from the video where I sold my Wood... Where the Woodford returned some capital and I put the money into Merchants Investment Trust. Uh, so yeah, he's just condoling me on my... Well, my stupid decision. <laughs> And then he asks a question about merchant's cost. It says, is the 0.35% annual management charge on top of the 0.59% ongoing charge? So if we look in the fact sheet from Hargreaves Lansdowne, this is what he's talking about. Annual management charge, so that's how much the fund managers actually charge you. To charge you. But then actually this number does include that number. So what this number is, is the 0.35 management charge plus other costs. Uh, making it a total of 0.59%. So actually the 0.94% doesn't apply here because it's a total of 0.59. Uh, on top of the 0.45% would be high. Now, so the first thing to say is actually Hargreaves Lansdowne don't charge 0.45% on shares and an investment trust is a share. So actually you don't get charged that 0.45%. So, I mean, the only time you would get charged it is if you had an ISA with Hargreaves Lansdowne and you only had a low amount of money in there because they charge 0.45% up to £45 a year just to get the £45 a year. So if you owned only merchants in Hargreaves Lansdowne ISA, not the non-ISA account, you would, I guess you would get charged the 0.45%, but it would be a maximum of £45 a year. So, in actual fact, it wouldn't be... It wouldn't be anywhere near the 0 0.94 plus 0 0.45. It would just be 0 0.59 plus the amount it costs you to buy. So stamp duty, I think about 12 quid in Hargreaves Lansdowne. Um, but in actual fact, I don't own it in Hargreaves Lansdowne. I own this in iWeb. So it costs me £5 to buy plus half a percent stamp duty. And that's it. And then, and then ongoing 0.59%. But obviously that's just an estimate. Um, the, the difference between 0.35 and 0.59, that varies depending on how much cost they incur. If, if they trade a lot, it will go higher. If they don't trade so much, it will go lower. Um, and then he asks, uh, how would you compare it to the Vanguard FTSE UK equity income as an alternative? It has a 0.414% OC, ongoing charge, and 5.19% dividend. So uh, let's have a look at it. Um, so I looked into this and it's, um, we go here, it is an index of the higher yielding FTSE companies. And as you can see, there's actually 130, well actually this is the annual report from 2018, so there's actually 130 stocks. So it must be the higher yield, highest yielding 130, I don't know to be honest. But it, it's obviously it's, it's an index tracker, so it's not making any investment decisions. And so obviously because it chooses the higher yield ones, it's more comparable to merchants. So it's it's obviously a good index. It's a good alternative. It's a good tracker tracker to compare it to because obviously if if um, the commenter had said the UK all share, it would have been comparing a roughly five percent yield with a roughly four and a bit percent yield. So this is this is more appropriate to compare it to, I guess. So let's compare the two. So first of all, let's just have a look at the performance for five years. I, fa I find that the AIC website is the best one for comparing total return. Because most of the time when you get graphs like on here for investment trusts, it just shows you the capital values. Then you have to take into account the dividends yourself. But the AIC's website does it properly, it does a total perform total returns. And as you can see here, I've managed to find so I've put merchants in and I've put I've managed to find the tracker here. And just as a sense check, you can see there the five year performance is twenty two point seven two. And if we go to 
our grid lands down, which all, which also this is total return as you can see there. Um, the five year return is 22.72, so I'm fairly confident I've found the right one. Um, and as you can see, over the last five years, Merchants has done better. Um, I don't know how much of that's come in recent times though, because look, they were pretty close just down here, weren't they? So I don't know, I mean, if you'd, if you'd done this comparison a year ago, look at that point there. It might have been identical-ish at that point. Oh, it says up here. Oh no, so Merchants were still a bit higher. The graph looks closer though, doesn't it? Yeah, 14 versus 8 point something. The graph looks closer there, but have you, have you, have you done the comparison there? From the 8th of February 2015 to the 8th of February 2020. Oh no, sorry, that's not 2020, is it? 18th of February 2018, it would have been pretty damn close. So obviously it all depends on the time period you look at. But we've only got five years. Oh, actually, have we got more data here? Oh yeah, ten years. That's good. So yeah, over 10 years, Merchants has done better. Um, but obviously, past performance isn't a guide to future performance, is it? I wonder, wonder what if we put 2015 in there. Do we get any different results? Merchants is still a bit higher. Yeah, but, you know, you could go all day do, doing it granularly. You could do, you could do every five-year period that they've got data for, couldn't you? But, but the few I've put in, Merchant seems to be doing better anyway. I'm looking at, yeah, I want to just check the charges because I, I never trust, I never trust information we get here. I just wanted to double check. So this is the Merchant's Trust annual report from last year. So this table here t tells us the investment management fee. So obviously you can see here that they charge some of it to revenue and some of it to capital, but the total fee was two for one two. 277 and if we scroll down a bit we can get the total asset. total assets less current liabilities net total assets there we go so that's the to I mean this isn't going to give you an accurate number but it'll give us a, the right ballpark because it because this number total assets is a, is a, like a snapshot of one time point but I can only imagine they charge like an average of the pri of the asset values over the whole 365 days but they should should at least give us a sense check that we're somewhere in the ballpark. Four seven seven eight six zero. Not point not four. So I think maybe this snapshot must have been done at a low ebb in the market. So maybe maybe for some of the year, for a lot of the year, the value was higher than that, and that's why it's it's um not point four percent rather than not point three five. So let's just do the total cost as well. So it's investment management plus admin expenses. Two nine one. No, nope, that's not the right number. Total net assets. I think it was. It did happen to be the right number actually. Five three three nine two six seven three three. Zero point six percent. So that's very close to the zero point five nine. Okay, so I think we can we can safely assume that's kind of an accurate number there that we've been given. But then, right. So for the um, Vanguard UK Equity Income Index Fund. I go to Morningstar here. Well, actually, look in the annual report from Vanguard. And it says here, so they're the institutional ones, so I don't think we get those. I think this is, I think it's class A. It says here that the, the fees are 0 0.2, the ongoing charges are 0.22% rather than 0.14. But I do know that a lot of the Vanguard funds, this is actually a 2018. Um, actually, it's from April 2019, and I do know that a lot of the Vanguard funds had price reductions. And if we look here on the Morning Star information, they've got ongoing costs of 0.22%, which matches the annual report from Vanguard. But then they've also got a transaction fee of 0.05%, which would be the equivalent of the gap between 0.35 and 0.59 on merchants. But then it says here management fee 0.22, so I don't get it if the ongoing cost should be the management fee plus all of the other costs so shouldn't that number be 0.27 there I don't get this it kind of confuses me and then here they've got fees estimated so maybe maybe their estimate of the fees includes the whatever price reduction there might have been recently but then again it's, it's done the same thing it's got 
ongoing cost of 0 0.14, transaction fee of 0 0.1, 0 0.07, but the management fee of 0 0.14. So I don't know. Either there's something going wrong with the way they're giving us the information here. I mean, who knows? Maybe Vanguard give you um, just charge you whatever they need to charge you to get the total cost of 0 0.14. Maybe whatever the transaction fees are they take the hits themselves. Maybe they just say, right, we're going to charge you 0.14% regardless of our fees, of our transaction costs. Maybe that's the way it works. But anyway, I just thought I'd mention that because it does confuse me. This whole fee thing is ra rather a bit of a minefield. Um, so why do I, why would I prefer, why have I chosen merchants rather than any tracker? Um, I mean, the main reason for most of my invest, um, investment trusts is the dividend and the stability of the dividend so as you can see here it's always the same thing i just i like the stability of the dividends and how when they have bad years they can still keep to at least keep the dividend or right raise it by a little bit so as you, as you can see here in these three years they were kind of struggling a bit so as you can see they so they actually ended up paying us more dividends than they received from their investments on these two years not by much but um, but it's just nice to have a stability of the dividend and then in future years they're putting some away 6% was put away, 3% was put away there um, and if you look on the AIC information I can't be bothered checking it because uh, the uh, video will be long enough anyway you can see here the dividend cover years the number of years that the current revenue reserves can provide the current financial year of dividends so as you can see there, they've got so 93% of one year's dividends in the revenue reserve. So that so we could have a, a, a hefty um, recession and a dividend reduction in all the companies, you know, like like what happened last about 10 years ago. And they've got a fair amount there just to get us through the bad years. Um, but that obviously doesn't happen with trackers. So that's really the main reason why. I don't go for any tracker. Well, I go for a FTSE 250 tracker, but at some point, I'll be getting rid of that at some point. Um, but this part of my portfolio, I want stable income. Um, so let's have a look at the, um, the Vanguard's dividends. I haven't looked at this yet. I'll be able to find it for this one. I've got it for these ones. Ah, right, okay. Let's try this. It's a fun note. This is an ETF. I don't know if they got to give you the same information for funds. Let's try. UK equity income. I found that different search terms bring up what I'm looking for. It's a bit tricky to find funds 107. FTSE UK equity income index fund. That'll be the one. Oh, yeah, income. Yeah, that's the one I want. Ah, that's good. Okay, cool. Distributions, there we go. Right, so there is some information. Okay, so um, so I managed to get this data from the Vanguard website. It goes back to 2010, I think, is when the fund started. So I've basically copied it all into the spreadsheet here and I've added it up for each year. The, the month here is irrelevant. I've added, this is the total for the year of 2010 total for the year of 2011. Um, so as you can see here, the dividend history is kind of up and down, you know, it's it's down down a fair bit, up, up a bit, down a bit. This is the percentage change from each year. Um, and as you can see, that's the sort of thing that I don't really want um, in my income section of my portfolio. I want my solid income section and then a growth section. Um, but if we compare it to merchants dividends which is here that's the value for that's the total for each year that's the um, percentage increase each year um there's no no spectacular number of increases there but there's also no spectacular decreases which is is what i want and um, as you can see the overall number this is this is that year compared to each of the years that year compared to each of the years in this column and as you can see by the end of the what is it nine years eight years of eight years um they're pretty close so obviously the track has grown more but as you saw from merchants has done better hasn't it in total performance so 
something it must have done better in capital performance merchants than um than this tracker and but yeah but as as this is for the income section of a portfolio i'd much rather have numbers like that on the on the percentage percentage change in dividend than numbers like that even if the end result is that compared to that right yeah and then the the charges um there's one thing that i kind of when i'm buying investment trust in particular obviously this doesn't apply to open-ended funds um is the gearing one thing i think about a lot is the gearing and i try in my mind because I am fully aware, I, I do buy into the fact that index trackers could be a better overall performance because the market is just so, what's the word? The market is has everything priced in. It's efficient, that's the word I was looking for. The markets are so efficient that an active fund manager will struggle to beat the market. Um, I do kind of buy into that, but then I often think to myself, um, this perceived wisdom is actually based on recent times, and I'm always thinking to myself, I always think things ebb and flow. I always think like, well, just because it's doing, it's um, it's been that way for the past 10, 20 years doesn't mean that it'll carry on forever. Some, uh, and at some point, the active managers might make some sort of fight back, who knows. But, you know, it's not... I don't know, but anyway, in terms of in terms of the charges and how I think about the charges, I I always think about for investment trusts. I always think about how the gearing helps for performance over the long term, and actually sometimes sometimes the difference in the charges can just be purely made up by the gearing, and so. Because the idea is that the higher charges mean that the fund manager has a higher hurdle to jump to beat the tracker, so he doesn't he, he doesn't have to he has to beat the mark beat the market, but he has to beat it by well what's the number in this case 0 0.59 minus 0 0.14 he has to beat the market by 0 0.45 percent a year to do better than this tracker. So he doesn't have to just beat the market, he has to beat it by a little extra. And that's why people focus a lot on charges, about that 0.45% a year makes it harder for the investment manager to beat them. But I think when I, when I think about um, investment trust, though, I like the fact that they take on borrowings and that leverages their, their returns. Um, so what I've done here is a little example. I mean, I don't just buy them because of this, but I just, it's a way of offsetting it in my mind a bit, especially with these low charged, because this is quite a low ongoing charge for an active fund, really, considering Fundsmith charges 0.95% and then adds a little bit on for um, transaction fees and stuff. Um, is this, so, uh, the uh, renegotiation of debt, Here's a, I'm just getting information here. So as you can see here, whenever this was, they, re, they announced that they renegotiated some debt. And in it, they've told us that the weighted average interest rate on all borrowings has fallen from 8.5% in January 1.8 to 6% today. And following this re, re, refinancing exercise, it will be 3.5% going forward. I think a lot of this debt is really long term as well, at fixed rates. So what I've done is I've just plugged in some numbers here. So here's here's the, let's assume they all return the same. I've put in some random numbers here for each year, 7% minus 2. Just, I'm tr just trying to simulate randomly what might happen in the next 20 years. But I've made it so that the annual returns are 7%. So each of them yield about 5%. So let's say there's a 5% yield from the dividend and then maybe they grow the capital by 2% a year as well. Who knows, maybe it's optimistic, maybe it's not, I don't know. But as you can see here, I've given them the same returns of the underlying underlying investments. So this is this is really a... It's a like-for-like like comparison, just looking at the charges and, and having a look to see if the gearing can take away the charges, can take away the difference in the charges, like make up for it. So, as you can see here, that I've then 
what I've done is I've started at £100, £100, yeah, and I've added the total return for the year, and then I've subtracted the charges, which is 0.14% multiplied by the value of 100 quid. It's probably not done like that, but it's just a rough idea. It's, it's probably not as simple as that in reality, but it gives us a ballpark figure. And then it just does that for every year. And as you can see, it gives you a total annual return of 7%. So actually, the underlying assets have grown by 7.14% each year in when you plug in all these numbers. Um, we've given the gearing a 3.5% interest rate. Could go lower, could go higher in the future, who knows. Um, but as it stands today, 3.5%. And we're at, we're at about 20% gearing, I think, at the moment. So I've stuck with roughly 20%. Um, and then I've just grown the assets. So with 20% gearing, the value starts at 100, 100 uh, pounds, like, like the first one does. So with 20% gearing, that means we've got 20 quid. And we've got a 20 quid liability. So we owe 20 pounds, but we've also got 20 extra pounds in our asset pool. So that gives us a gearing of 20%. Um, so basically this this column here now grows or falls by this amount it then subtracts the interest at 3.5 percent and it also subtracts the charges at 0.59 percent uh, to give that number and obviously the liability start stays the same because they just pay the interest until the debt's due whenever it's due and then the value of the portfolio is the assets minus the liabilities of 20. Um, so what I've done all, here also is I've kind of I've, I've had to adjust the liabilities because if I didn't adjust the liabilities, the gearing level would just go lower and lower and lower, and that's not how the fund managers do their gearing. They they look at it as a percentage, and if it gets lower and lower and lower, they might think about increasing it, which is kind of counterintuitive because it would get lower as the price of the assets go higher, won't won't it? But actually, maybe when the assets are going higher in value might be the time to reduce gearing and wait for a slump and then you can increase gearing when everything's dropped like in these years maybe that year would be a good year good year to increase your gearing maybe well yeah obviously hindsight's a great thing but in reality the best thing to do would be to get pay off all your gearing reduce it all down to zero and then two years later get it back up to 20 percent when all the prices are lower by 12 plus percent but you know that's hindsight so what I've done in this example is I've kind of kept the gearing level for a while and it's got a bit low so let's let's just add eight pounds worth of gearing there so obviously when you add eight pounds there you also have to add eight pounds to your assets so you've added eight pounds to your liabilities and you've added eight pounds to your assets boosted the gearing back up to about 20 percent and then it's plotted along again and I've done a similar thing here I've added 12 pounds to the assets and the gearing here and the uh, liabilities here just so that this number doesn't fall completely low so by keeping the number there and as you can see the, the effect of the gearing is that actually even though this one charges 0.545 percent more than this one the annual return is actually 0.515 percent higher because of the gearing they've got identical portfolios so it kind of levels the playing field in terms of the charges so now with that with if that's how the gearing went and in this scenario which is completely random obviously and would never happen like this but in this scenario the fund manager doesn't have to beat the tracker by 0.45 percent it actually only has to beat it by well it can it can lose to the tracker by 0.15 percent i suppose but it just it levels the playing field so you might have an opinion that the fund manager might do better but even if he doesn't do better even if he does the same or a little slightly lower purely the gearing itself can make up for these charges for these high, slightly higher charges um anyway i hope i've explained that properly but obviously you know with um <laughs> obviously if if this happens yep absolutely boo good aren't you
sixty-one pounds versus forty-seven pound. But obviously, it's a you know, the whole world would be coming to an end if that sort of thing happened, wouldn't it? Anyway, right. What else is there to say? Yeah, I mean, um, I do. I do often think maybe I should just go full tracker, though. To be fair. There's, that's, I've given my reasonings why I've gone for merchants rather than uh, an index tracker, but I do. I, you know, I'm not. I'm not completely set in this way, as you can see from one of these previous videos here. One of my kind of portfolios that I'm thinking about is mainly trackers, because, like I said, I've said this before. You know, sometimes I don't know. I do doubt myself sometimes on this on this idea of going for mostly active managed funds but I don't know I'll stick with it who knows all right okay that was a long one wasn't it all right see you next time cheers bye